Hello, everybody. Uh, it's uh, really uh, a pleasure and an honor for us to have Dr. Harsh Mandar visit us. Uh, and I'm sure people here uh, really don't need to be introduced to Dr. Harsh Mandar. They have traveled uh, uh, from far distances. Of course, there are students. There are people who wouldn't normally go out who have come. But I think this is especially a very important occasion for us, apart from the fact that uh, uh, Dr. Harshmandar is truly an inspirational character. And I'll tell you why, because <laughs> we have been trying to convince him to stay for a longer period of time in Germany, uh, trying to convince him that uh, he would be much safer living here. Uh, than go back to India, where he faces uh, a wide variety of uh, assaults that have already taken place on him. But he is very, very deeply convinced and motivated by the fact that he must go back and do his work. Uh, therefore, we will not have the privilege of having Dr. Harshmandar in Germany after the 31st of August. Uh, I, just, I don't want to take too much of your time apart from saying that uh, the Indian Constitution upholds certain values uh, that belong to a generation, an ideation, and a commitment. And there are very few people who represent rather embody and manifest that commitment to a greater extent than Dr. Harshmandar. Many of you will know that uh, there was a context which led to his resignation from the Indian Administrative Service after his having done fantastic work to improve the state of the administration. Ever since he has tried to be a conscience keeper outside of government but seeking very, very fiercely to uphold the Constitution. So with those very few words, uh, let the floor to Dr. Harshman. Thank you, uh, Rahul. Thank you, all of you, for gathering here. And uh, many beloved friends uh, and senior colleagues uh, whose faces I see uh, here. Uh, yeah, lovely to see all of you. Um, I'll leap right in. Uh, uh, there's a lot to say. Uh, at some point, uh, Rahul can stop me. Uh, but, uh, and I hope we have time for conversations as well. Uh, India finds itself today in a frighteningly dark and violent space of fear and hate. It is fast becoming a particularly terrifying place to live in if you are a member of a minority especially a Muslim, but increasingly in some parts of the country if you are a Dalit, an Adivasi or a Christian. Young people in India are often not mindful of how far we have strayed from the country that was imagined or promised in the freedom struggle led by Mahatma Gandhi and the India written into its constitution uh, led by Dr. Ambedkar. The so-called democratic world today cares even less uh, uh, about where the Indian Republic is headed and the dangers that lie ahead, not just for India, but indeed for the world. India stands today at a critical juncture of a battle that goes back at least a hundred years. This is a battle of imaginations, of ethics, of belonging and unbelonging. The choices that the Indian people make in the coming years will determine the contours of the country and in ways that I will argue the world that they will leave behind for our children. Let us for a moment go back to those hundred years and more to understand the nature of the contestation today and indeed why it is so important for the people uh, of, of India and the world to take note. Mahatma Gandhi's leadership of India's freedom struggle was based on a promise of a humane and inclusive country of equal belonging to people of every faith, caste, 
gender, language and ethnicity. But this was not an uncontested idea. Uh, the most um, powerful competition to this idea came from formations, the Hindu Mahasabha, which was constituted a little over 100 years ago, and the RSS, which actually came into being in 1925. Um, if you, and then later in, by the Muslim League. Talk about the RSS, uh, it's important to, to understand where they came from. Uh, in the early writings, there is actually open admiration expressed for Hitler and the nationalism that he represented. Uh, their basic premise was that India is a country of its Hindu majority, uh, not so clearly stated of its caste Hindu majority. And we, because the country belongs to us, will allow, if we choose, people of other identities, particularly India's Muslims and Christians, uh, we will allow them to live in our country, but only uh, as second-class citizens. In the Muslim League, uh, somewhat similarly, uh, held that uh, it is not possible for India's Muslim minority uh, to achieve e equality, security, development, um, unless they have a separate country and they demanded the creation of, an, of, a, of a new country, of a second country after the British left um, and that was Pakistan. Uh, they believed that it was not, you know, the two nation theory uh, is, is what they put forward. The irony of today's politics, there are many ironies, but one of them is that it seems that the ruling establishment in India today uh, is doing its utmost to prove that the Muslim League was right and that Mahatma Gandhi was wrong, uh, that Muslims and Hindus cannot live together with peace and goodwill and equality. Let me fast forward briefly to 1947. Uh, partition happened, uh, as we all know. Uh, a line was drawn on the land uh, and uh, rivers of blood began to flow. Uh, a, a million people, Hindu, Muslim, Sikh, killed each other in, 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 a, in a crazy sort of uh, burst of, 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 of hate, hate violence. Uh, about 15 million people were displaced from their homes. Uh, it became the largest movement, distress movement of human populations in human history, apart probably from the movement of, uh, of people from Africa uh, on the slave trade. My own family incidentally was among those who were displaced uh, from what is now in Pakistan. And uh, we have grown up with, with, with those memories. Um, at that time, I'm picturing that time very briefly, uh, Pakistan had been constituted, uh, train loads were flowing on, 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 on both, uh, in both directions. Sorry, uh, was I mute so far? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah it's good now. Good, uh, many apologies. Um, can I... Can I just briefly recap for, for, for friends who are hearing? Uh, I talked about India today being in a frighteningly dark and violent space of fear and hate. Um, young people not being mindful of how far we have strayed from the country that was imagined and promised in the freedom struggle or written into the constitution. I talked about a battle that actually goes back at least a hundred years a battle of imaginations, of ethics, of belonging and unbelonging, and how crucial uh, the decisions that uh, the people of India will take uh, will, uh, you know, for, 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 the, for the country and the world that they will leave behind for our children. Um, I spoke of Gandhi, Gandhi's return and his taking up the leadership of our freedom struggle. 
his promise that India would be a humane, inclusive country of equal belonging for people of every faith, caste, uh, language, class, ethnicity, gender. I spoke about the competing ideas of the Hindu Mahasabha and the RSS and the Muslim League. And I fast forwarded to, par uh, to partition itself in 1947. Uh, in these times, uh, because Pakistan had been constituted, because there was such a frenzy of hate, violence that seemed to have no end, uh, the idea <laughs> became more and more powerful that Muslims have their Pakistan, so uh, Hindus must have their India. And, uh, and uh, I think uh, we need to be enormously mindful, but also grateful uh, that we had a leadership at that time who said, no, uh, India is home equally uh, to its Muslim citizens. Uh, whoever chooses to belong will belong and will belong as equal citizens. Uh, a few glimpses of those, those times when uh, India at the night of 15th August, when we got our freedom, uh, Gandhiji was not in Delhi uh, in the celebrations. He was in Calcutta, where a slaughter was unfolding every day uh, without end of Muslims and, and, and Hindus. Mahatma Gandhi finally decided to go on, a, on an epic fast and said, I will not eat until uh, every single act of violence ends. And there are many stories told of the, those, those days. Uh, one that I love a lot is, uh, is that you know, while he was fasting, a, very, a man in great anguish, uh, a man of Hindu identity, very angry with Gandhiji, came and said, what you're doing is, is terribly wrong. I had a child this small, a child who, who, who was slaughtered by Muslim mobs. How can I overcome my, my hate? And how can I heal? And Gandhiji's response was, I understand your pain, but if you really want to overcome that pain, I suggest you find a Muslim boy, just this small, uh, whose parents have been killed by Hindu mobs. Adopt him as your own child and raise him like you would have raised your son. And maybe you'll find some space in your heart uh, to heal and to forgive. A um, couple of other stories of that moment. Um, there's somebody called Anis Kadbai. Her husband got killed uh, during the riots trying to save lives. She came to Gandhi and she recounts that he was very distraught. And uh, he said, my, my life's work will not be complete until a Muslim child cannot walk without fear. Uh, in, in this city uh, where all this violence was unfolding. His very last fast, uh, two weeks before he was assassinated, was again uh, uh, many mosques and dargahs in the rage of people. They had sort of forcefully placed Hindu idols into them and said that uh, uh, you know, Muslims have no place in this country and his last fast one of his demands was, was that uh, no true religion of any kind is based on disrespect to people of another faith. Uh, we must return with respect uh, each of these places of worship. His other demand was that you know, the, the Muslims who had been driven out of their homes because the refugees uh, who had come in their millions could only get a home here if Muslims had vacated those homes. And his demand was that, no, you go to the relief camps and invite back the, the Muslim owners saying, no, this is still your country uh, and, uh, and, and so on. Uh, it was, you know, it was in, uh, it was this insistence of humane and inclusive citizenship uh, and his, his, his conviction to his last breath that India would belong equally to its Muslim citizens that led to his assassination. Uh, it is important to look back with immense gratitude, not just of Indians, but actually of humankind everywhere, for the immense moral courage that he demonstrated at the time of India's partition. This is what I call radical love. 
Free India's constitution, the writing of which was led by Dr. Ambedkar, pledged that India would be this humane and inclusive country, assuring equal citizenship for people of every uh, faith, caste, gender, language, culture, ethnicity. It would not matter which god you worship or if you worship no god, you would be an equal citizen in every way. The Hindutva project, which is uh, which has reached its very dominant moment, as I said, stands for a radically different imagination for India. It rejects the idea of equal citizenship. It requires at its core a radical, violent rupture between India's Hindus and those of the hated other that it constructs, uh, particularly India's Muslims. From my, my vantage, India's immense tragedy today is that people steeped through their entire adult lives and longer in this Hindu supremacist ideology that actually spurred Mahatma Gandhi's killing are in fact ruling India today. They seek an India that belongs most of all to its caste Hindus. To this India, as I said, they can allow Muslims and Christians and Dalits, but only as second class citizens who live always subordinate and in fear and in submission uh, to Hindu majorities. Um, for Muslims, their preference would actually be further that they should be expelled, but where will you expel 200 million people? India's leaders today seem more and more determined than ever to push the country down this horrific path of hate, fear, resentment, grievance and bloodshed. But is it actually correct to believe that India is in present danger of, of a genocide? Genocide Watch does believe. Uh, in its latest report, it writes of early signs of an impending genocide in India. The US Holocaust Memorial goes further. It lists India as the second, you know, as the country second most in danger of, uh, of slipping into genocide uh, or a mass extermination of people of a hated identity. Many people, of course, in angry denial um, and refuse to acknowledge these early signs of a violent uh, catastrophe possible in the future. But I'm convinced that you only need the, the eye to see, the heart to care, and the courage to call out your warning while there is still time. I've spent the last few months in Germany uh, trying to understand uh, how the German people have dealt with the, the history uh, of Nazi Germany. Um, and one of the things I agonize to witness uh, is how similar in so many ways is what happened to the Jews in the 1930s prior to the Shoah and what is happening uh, to India's Muslims today. Uh, to list just a few of these similarities, one is runaway hate speech by senior political leaders in the media, in academia, in popular culture, uh, and also by ordinary citizens. These serve to manufacture popular hatred and legitimize bigotry. This stunning rise, uh, especially in toxic hate speech by senior leaders in government or political parties. Uh, uh, there's an organization which tracks what it calls VIP hate speech. And it found, found a 1,130% rise in VIP hate speech uh, since uh, Mr. Modi came to power in 2014 compared to the preceding regime. Led sometimes by the Prime Minister but much more shrilly by his Home Minister, by several Chief Ministers and Union Ministers. This hate speech pandemic, if you like, stigmatizes, taunts, insults, and sometimes openly incites violence against India's Muslims. This hate speech falsely constructs and depicts Muslims as bigoted, violent oppressors of Hindus in history, as breakers of Hindu temples, and in contemporary times, variously as infiltrators, unpatriotic, loyal to Pakistan, terrorists, sexual predators, love jihadis, cow killers, child breeders, and infiltrators again. Christians are portrayed as deviously deploying overseas donations to bribe impoverished people into converting to Christianity 
under the cloak of humanitarian services. Even Mother Teresa's uh, is not exempt from this hate construction. Online and in public gatherings, a range of other extreme right-wing supporters, from people in saffron robes, jobless youth, to upmarket high-tech doyans, are even more candid in spouting uh, their hate, openly calling for boycotts, expulsions, mass killing, mass rape and genocide. Sometimes for the record, occasionally, uh, and most notably recently when the uh, BJP national spokesperson uh, said, uh, made insulting comments about Prophet Muhammad uh, and uh, 15 Muslim majority countries protested. That was the time when uh, the Indian government's defense was, oh, these are just fringe elements. Uh, how can the national spokesperson of, of the ruling party who appears every night on television uh, defending and presenting the ruling party's viewpoint, uh, making hate speeches routinely be described uh, as, uh, as a fringe uh, person? Uh, but it's interesting that some of the worst offenders online of, uh, of, of this kind of daily hate mongering are followed even by the Prime Minister uh, on Twitter. Um, looking back at Nazi Germany, one of the lessons we are constantly reminded of is that the Holocaust did not begin uh, in the gas chambers. The Holocaust began with hate speech. Then we see tar you know, targeted hate violence against minorities by citizen vigilante groups and, and individuals and the permissive role of law enforcement agencies and courts. Uh, in the, you know, from 2014, but even more from about 2016, we are seeing an outbreak of, of, of lynching where mobs gather and beat to death uh, 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 mostly Muslim men, sometimes Dalit men. Uh, on unproved charges of cow slaughter, love jihad and, and, and other such crimes, but very often actually for nothing except being visibly of a particular identity. And this is performative violence uh, in the sense that, you know, very much like uh, in Jim Crow's America, uh, families used to gather, crowds used to gather, it was like a picnic, people would watch while the lynching happened. That performative character has now been replaced with, with, with the video camera. Almost every lynching is videotaped by the perpetrators, which incidentally also says that they're putting their faces on, uh, you know, on film, committing crimes for which uh, under Indian law they could actually go to the gallows, but they're sure that that's not going to happen. And these are circulated uh, widely on social media, consumed by millions. Um, and this continues relentlessly. A child is beaten for drinking water in a, in a temple. A Muslim child, a youth, Muslim youth is beaten up because he dares to sell bangles to Hindu girls and others beaten up for selling meat. You know, you, every day you read uh, more and more of these, uh, of these stories. And it's getting more and more openly provocative. So. Uh, uh, in, in, on on Ram Navmi, which is which celebrates Lord Ram's uh, birth anniversary, this year we found, uh, you know, even more than earlier, it was observed by mobs of young young men gathering outside mosques and and just screaming the most violent slogans over and over and over again uh, outside the mosque. Uh, uh, you know, I, I can't even repeat uh, some of those and the video is going, going viral. Somebody, at, you know, in the middle of this getting provoked very wrongly and, and throwing a stone and a skirmish breaking out, violence breaking out. And then, you know, one more red line that we find in recent months has been crossed is that after a day or two, the, the administration brings out bulldozers and just it, it says that we have according to our information these 10 people 
took part in, in, the, in the violence two days ago and we are going to punish them by, by bulldozing their homes. Uh, no law in the world allows government to bulldoze people's homes if, if, even if they have committed a crime and, and there's a legal process uh, obviously to prove a person's guilt. Uh, there's not even now the, the semblance of an adherence to any kind of constitutional rule of law and people uh, are, are, are being bulldozed. The bulldozers are now becoming you know, icons of, 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 of celebration uh, and you have, uh, I'm told, uh, bulldozer caps, uh, you know, emblazoned with bulldozers, bulldozer uh, t-shirts and, and so on and so forth. Then, uh, you know, these two hate speech and hate violence, but I'll, I'll list a few others. There's the targeting of cultural and religious practices. And here I'm talking about many echoes with 1930s Germany uh, and, and shrines of the targeted minorities, uh, altering of laws of citizenship that exclude in various ways from equal citizenship the targeted minorities, creating either de facto or de jure uh, second class citizenship or even pushing them towards uh, a kind of manufactured uh, uh, possible statelessness. Uh, genocide uh, watch here draws ominous parallels also with Myanmar where, where Rohingyas were first declared non-citizens then brutally attacked and expelled. Uh, in India the citizenship amendment law for the first time made a distinction uh, on the basis of religion and first would require everybody to uh, to produce their, to prove their citizenship by producing documents, uh, vintage documents that go back to your grandparents and earlier. Uh, I could not produce, uh, I don't even know the names of all the siblings of, 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 of my grandparents, for instance, let alone their documents, but I would have to produce those uh, in order to prove that I'm an Indian citizen. Now, what the Sidgham Amendment Act said was that if you are undocumented, if you are unable to prove your citizenship and you belong to any other religious identity, uh, Hindu, Sikh, e e e even Christian, uh, it will be presumed that you are a persecuted minority from a neighboring country and you will get citizenship. But if you are of Muslim identity, this presumption will no, not apply. So in a you know, in a very direct way for the first time, the whole idea of a citizenship to India being contingent on your religious identity uh, uh, came forward. I recall that I, uh, you know, learning again from Mahatma Gandhi's civil disobedience, I wondered what to do because, uh, you know, when you were confronted with an unjust law, uh, he, he said, we have to publicly disobey that law. But then it doesn't end there. You also have to demand punishment. My dilemma was that I declare that I will not produce any documents to prove my citizenship uh, if the government you know, starts implementing this law. But the trouble is I will not be punished because the law is actually designed in order to protect me from my religious identity. So I put out a statement the day this was being debated and passed in Parliament saying that my civil disobedience will be not only to refuse to produce documents but also in this case to register myself as Muslim when government asks you what your religion is and I'll say I register myself as Muslim, I will not produce documents and if any of my Muslim sisters and brothers are declared uh, non-citizens because they could not produce the documents, I will demand that I get the same punishment. Um, once again, there are nightmarish, uh, frightening echoes of the Nuremberg laws uh, in Germany with citizenship. Likewise, on uh, legal and social barriers on interreligious, uh, romantic sexual relations and marriages, uh, uh, the idea of love jihad in the run-up to elections to UP uh, uh, in, in their manifesto, they said they would, they would uh, have uh, 10 years of punishment for love jihad, which really is, is supposed to be this extraordinary conspiracy where good-looking Muslim boys are picked out from madrasas, trained 
to uh, attract Hindu girls uh, who obviously have nothing in their heads and uh, but they're actually doing it not because they love them but because they want to produce more Muslim babies out of them and, and it's really at one level it's such an absurd idea but you're killing people for this reason you're threatening to put people into prison uh, for 10 years uh, for this uh, other items rewriting history in ways that ways that demonize targeted minorities and valorize the role of dominant groups renaming cities and roads to erase the participation of minority groups and in my study here this all of these happen in germany rewriting of textbooks and uh, you know educational systems to exclude and demonize mi minorities very importantly the targeting of the economic base of of these targeted minorities their livelihoods and their properties uh, both using vigilante action and changes in law uh, uh, forced separate living and ghettoization of the target minorities i could go on uh, what troubles me and worries me even more than these actions that so much echo uh, germany in the 1930s uh, what echoes even more strongly is the degree of popular support uh, and and so uh, uh, illustratively uh, in Guru, Guru Gram, which is just is this high-tech city, uh, just adjacent to the national capital, uh, it expanded sort of many times over. Uh, the population grew, a lot of migrants came in, but there were only two mosques. So on Friday, there was no place for people to pray, so they used to pray in, uh, in, uh, in, in open parks. But suddenly, they started this campaign that we don't want to see them. So exactly at on, at Friday at, at one o'clock, you get crowds of people gathering at all the spots earmarked for 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 Friday prayers, where we want to now play a cricket match here. We want to uh, have some Hindu prayers exactly at uh, on Friday afternoon, etc. It is that popular participation, uh, uh, and there are many such examples. But let me also underline, it is not just India that I worry about. Few countries in the world are today immune from the rise of far-right leaders who foster fear and hate against people of different faith, skin color, uh, ethnicity, belie beliefs, ways of life. Just at the borders of Germany, where I stand today, the elections in France were the most recent reminder of how growing sections of the electorate are subscribing to a politics of fear and resentment against people who they see as different, outsiders, interlopers, people who do not legitimately belong. These are signs of our world in tumult. Leaders in both electoral and authoritarian states are increasingly legitimizing hatred and bigotry, hollowing out thereby our democracy, eroding the ideals of equal citizenship and fraternity. It has become in increasingly dangerous for this reason, as I said, if you're a minority of any kind, religious, racial, ethnic, caste, gender, or, or, or a sexual minority. What is at stake in this tumult, and again I underline, is the country and the world that we wish to grow old in and leave for our children. I'm in Germany these past months trying to learn, as I said, from the German people, how they courageously confronted their horrific Nazi past. Perhaps the paramount lesson, uh, and I've learned a great deal, but the paramount lesson that I will carry away from Germany is how all people at all times remain vulnerable to the dangers of being drawn into the politics of resentment, suspicion, and frenzied hate. Intense cruelty by human beings to other human beings have recurred uh, in the planet uh, across the world through history. And the real and present danger exists today, as we speak, that it will continue to recur. Um, uh, a German pastor, Schott Lemmer, uh, he was speaking to uh, philosopher Susan Nyman for her remarkable book, remarkable book, Learning for the Germans, and he said something very important. He said, no culture, no country, no religion is immune to falling into the abyss into which we fell in Nazi Germany. And once this begins, there will always be people who shut down their conscience 
and side with the strong man? Can we recognize that our leaders have taken us in India and indeed in many parts of the world to the very edge of this abyss? Can we recognize that we have already begun to slip into this abyss? My desperate hope is that enough of us in India and around the world don't shut down our conscience. If indeed all people at all times do stand vulnerable to falling into the dark abyss of targeted collective hate, the only defense for humankind is for all people at all times to recognize and strengthen their capacities to treat people they see as different, not with suspicion, not with fear, but with friendship, uh, with curiosity and with a welcome. In other words, humankind must learn to lead live the lessons of living together with kindness. And I think this is one of the most important challenges. It's a civilizational challenge at this moment. The German state and people offer us an extraordinary example of the courage to collectively confront their gruesome and shameful recent collective histories of Nazi times, to repair, uh, to seek repair, atonement and as I think, trying to become worthy of forgiveness. With many limitations, and I'll speak about them, I underline that there are few examples in modern times of this kind of journey undertaken by our people anywhere in the world, anywhere in history. What makes Germany singular and admirable is that its people have owned their collective responsibility, even guilt, as a nation state for the unspeakable atrocities perpetrated uh, in recent German history by National Socialism. The journey of atonement is at its soul the affirmation of the aspiration for accomplishing fraternity and humanity in their fullness. Uh, I don't have the time and I've learned how difficult it was for Germany to reach this point, how immediately after the war the first generations were in denial, uh, bitter denial. It took a, a generation more uh, beginning with 1968 and the student uprising of that time uh, and many more landmarks to reach the place that the German people have arrived to. Uh, uh, not many countries in the world still would be as brave as Germany to enable its citizens and its children to acknowledge such a brutal and shameful history and to learn from its critical importance, from the critical importance of respecting and embracing diversity and pluralism. Every German school child, uh, as part of her uh, school education, visits concentration camps, visits these memorials, rec is recounted this history. Um, and as Susan Nyman observes, a nation that erects a monument of shame for the evils of its history at its most prominent uh, space uh, in, in Berlin, uh, where the Museum of Murdered Jews is placed. Uh, this represents a nation not afraid to confront its own failures. It's hard to imagine this happening in most countries of today's world. Think of a United States if its most prominent monuments mark its brave crimes of history. Slavery, lynching, racial segregation, mass incarceration and the annihilation of Native Americans. Imagine a United States where all the prominent monuments were really to remember these crimes. Or countries of Western Europe center staging monuments that acknowledge the massive crimes of colonialism. Or in my own country, memorials to mark the mass slaughter of people, mostly minorities, during the partition riots and the many pogroms that followed. Or even more pertinently, to mark millennia of violent crimes and discrimination against Dalits and against women. Having noted so much that we can admire and learn from the German people in the ways that they have dealt with these collective crimes of the Nazi period, I do have some lingering and powerful concerns that I feel must be confronted if the new social contract of fraternity and solidarity that the German people are attempting so remarkably to craft is to endure. Otherwise, they too still stand at the edge of the same abyss with the same danger of falling and I'll try to argue why. My first concern is that I believe that there's still not to recognize 
the culpability in Nazi crimes of large segments of the German population. You know, there is a, there's an acknowledgement that, you know, great evil happened, but it happened because there was this evil person called Hitler and his band of people who, who were around him. Uh, not that the evil happened because most of us, our grandparents, our society supported and actively participated. And the degree to which there was active participation, the more I read and learn, uh, the more horrifying it is. Uh, just to talk about the concentration camps itself, every concentration camp, they were not hidden, they were happening right there. You were seeing Jews being uh, you know, tra transported, uh, you were seeing the smoke out of the chimneys. Uh, the people who, uh, who were doing the killings were not soldiers, because soldiers were fighting the war. It was civilians who were, uh, who were recruited. And uh, there are records that there was no shortage of people who wanted to volunteer. Uh, and there was right from the time of you know, making lists, uh, transporting them, bringing them into the concentration camps, and many other steps uh, people participated in, 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 in all of this. Um, and it, not just uh, ordinary people in this way, uh, uh, the church, uh, the role that the church played, uh, the role of intellectuals, the role of universities, scientists, big industry, artists, doctors, and so on, the list is long. Uh, historians estimate that the opposition to Hitler's regime was just about less than 1%. That is what I'm told by many historians. This does not mean that 99% people supported the Nazi genocidal project, but they were silent. Um, what could be the reasons for this silence? The biggest defense that is given when we speak today is that we did not know, but that is a very thin uh, defense um, as I said, concentration camps were in the vicinity, uh, your own neighbours were being marched and never returned. Uh, but even more importantly, forced labour was happening all across the country, uh, in front of you, uh, in front of all of us. Um, and, uh, you know, so what could be then the reasons for silence? The first was indeed fear, and fear is genuinely a reason of silence of the 99%. But fear is sometimes exaggerated as an alibi because, again, uh, I read that there are many examples of people who refused to, to do the killings and they were simply given a different job. Uh, 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 the punishment was not extreme. Um, the second possibility then for my silence could be indifference. I'm not a Jew, I'm not a Roma Sinti person, I'm not a homosexual, I'm not a communist, I'm not a disabled person. This will not happen to me, so why should I care? A third reason, and I, you know, I have learned this uh, with even more worry, is that people actually profited. Uh, I, I met a young friend who was talking about his grandmother and he said, when I asked my grandmother, which was the best period in your life, he said, she's a simple woman, so she says it openly. He said, of course, the Nazi period. And you ask her why, and she said, oh, they sent away the Jews and we got all their properties cheap and uh, you know, we lived a, lived a good life. Um, but it wasn't just here, I find, that universities uh, became centers of anti-Semitism because a lot of the Jewish intellectuals were expelled, uh, new opportunities were created, new businesses started. Um, and there was also white profiting from forced labor. All, almost every big industry, but even small industries, the, the street side bakery, farms, employed forced labor. It was a massive project. Uh, whether you were anti-Semitic, not sure, but, uh, but you benefit. And a fourth but most culpable reason for silence can be that people were silent because they supported the project of hate discrimination. What numbers fit into this, it's hard to say now. Uh, but, uh, uh, but as I, you know, I, there was a book called Hitler's uh, Willing Executioners by 
Daniel Goldhagen. It's one of the most terrifying books I've read, where uh, where he describes how ordinary people would you know would actually do this business, volunteer to do it. You kill a hundred people, their body parts on your on your clothes. You brush them off. Uh, you have a bath in the evening and sit with your friends and have a drink and set out the next morning. Uh, this happened. It happened in a massive way. Uh, so as I said, it's difficult to estimate what proportion of the German people har harbored active ideological support for the genocidal crimes of the Third Reich. Most historians are unwilling to make estimates, but some of them tell me that it could be about 40% of the people, which is still a very significant number. Uh, I also, you know, when I, when we look back in terms of culpability, I wonder about, you know, has there been sufficient atonement just by ordinary people? Um, somebody uh, was telling me about a research they did as recently as 2019, 2018, I think, when they asked young people about their histories, their family histories, and they said that, you know, something like I think 23% people said that my, my grandparents actually saved Jews, which obviously is not true. Uh, the, the proportion was about 0.001% people who saved Jews. But it was, you know, we, we are not affirming that this, this evil resided among all of us. Because until we affirm and atone, we are not going to protect ourselves for the future. And this is not just about the German people, and this is one thing that I disagree a lot with Goldhagen, who said this was something specific to the German people. I think all of us have our histories of, of, of this kind of cruelty, in which all of us have histories of massive public participation in, in these crimes. Uh, there's also, you know, has big business sufficiently atoned for the crimes of mass forced labor? or the church for its problematic role. I, I find the church particularly worrying, or academia or the arts, uh, for their ideological legitimizing of Nazi genocidal ideologies, or doctors and the medical profession. And let me just sort of give you an illustration of the last, uh, from a journey I undertook about a week ago uh, to a place called Grafenek, what not too far from here. This is a place where actually uh, 10,000 disabled people, uh, persons with disabilities, were gassed uh, all in the course of one year. And this was almost like a pilot to the larger Holocaust. And, uh, and you know, when I, when I went there almost on, on a pilgrimage of pain to understand. And I, I couldn't believe, you know, there was a, there's, there's a form this small which doctors fill about persons, you know, who should be killed in all the care institutions. And the first question that was asked was, uh, can the person work? So is the person productive? Second question is, uh, uh, how much money does it cost to, uh, to look after this person? And number three was, does this person have anyone in the world to take care of uh, her or him? And uh, they had estimated that about 20% of the people in care institutions would be murdered. 50% uh, were murdered. Uh, in this time. Uh, every single day they were saying that four buses would come from care institutions in different parts of Germany carrying disabled people and, and they would be brought there, they wouldn't even sleep one night, they would be taken to the gas chambers and killed. I'm horrified about this being certified by doctors. I don't know if there's enough introspection today about how could doctors do this. The argument was actually doctors are responsible to take care of not just the cure the individual, but also society. And society is so burdened by taking care of these unproductive people. Um, you know, I saw a poster there uh, of this very handsome young blonde man uh, who was holding up on his shoulders the burden of two very sort of deformed looking disabled people. And it said, you know, this is what is being done to you. Each disabled person is costing some 65,000 marks uh, and, and so on. If you don't confront this, and I'll say one last thing on this, right? I'm really troubled how different is today's neoliberal arguments about why we shouldn't have welfare 
are we not making the same argument even today? That it's a burden on you know, hard-working, able-bodied, tax-paying people, that you have these unproductive people who you have to look after. The recognition of the equal worth of every human being, uh, independent of whether they produce or don't produce, is not something that we have done because have we not done this atonement? I talked about four concerns. This was the first. The second is what I see as a kind of implied hierarchy of who deserves to be mourned and who does not deserve to be mourned in the same way. Uh, something that one could call grievable lives, whose lives are worth grieving, the loss of which is worth grieving. And I see you know, that there has been an implied hierarchy. And rightly speaking, the, the horror of what happened to the Jews is acknowledged and there is an atonement. But there was an extermination of the Roma and Sinti people. And I have a young friend here who heads the National Center on the Roma and Sinti uh, <coughs> people here, right here in Heidelberg. Now, there wasn't the sense that this was wrong. Right up to the 70s and 80s when people went for compensation, the answer that they were given was that, but you were a criminal. You deserved what happened to you. And it's a grief that they carry to this day. Homosexual men. Homosexuality continued to be uh, illegal uh, uh, right up to, you know, it was uh, written down uh, in Western Germany in 69, but it, people continued to be charged with this crime. It was not even possible for you to come forward and say, my brother, my father, my, uh, my, my son was a homosexual man and uh, he suffered and I need a compensation for that. There wasn't, uh, uh, and disabled people, of course, uh, which, which I spoke about. This is a second worry, this implied hierarchy of, 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 of victims. And unless we reach a point when we believe that every life that was taken away was a life of equal worth, uh, I believe that that wonderful monument in Berlin should have been a monument to murdered people or, 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 or during uh, uh, of Nazi Germany. Uh, Linked to this is my third worry, that I found uh, that there is a strong conviction that we have to fight anti-Semitism. But, but even among people who, who are dedicating their lives wonderfully in fighting anti-Semitism and their officials, their NGO workers, etc., who are doing an amazing job, but meeting many of them, I found a very casual uh, sense of anti-Muslim sentiment, very common. And it raises to me, are we fighting anti-Semitism or anti-discrimination? You know, and it's, it's, it's a, it, they're two very different journeys, really. And for my own, my own life history, for instance, just very briefly, my parents were, uh, and my uh, family was from a place uh, near Rawalpindi uh, in Pakistan. And uh, the horrific stories that, that are told of how people uh, were escaping, it's, it's a really horrible story where uh, they were taking shelter in a, in a Sikh Gurdwara. And the mobs came, the men decided that we will protect, we will protect the honor of our women by forcing them to kill themselves. And women were made to jump into the well, uh, and many of them jumped into the well, others were, were cut down. These are the horrors of our own, my own biography, for instance, my own family biography. When I saw what was unfolding in, uh, in, in India, you know, with the uh, you know, things getting worse and worse, uh, Babri Masjid and so on, and then finally when Gujarat uh, 2002 happened, I felt I could not remain in the civil service. I, 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 I left, I wrote that this is not a riot, this is a state-sponsored massacre. And I dedicated my life standing, uh, you know, 
with the uh, with the survivors of this and the targets of this violence a large part of my extended family was fugitives and you know it was hard for me to go uh, to a to a social gathering a wedding because they would come up to me and say harsh we are so ashamed of you after all that we have suffered in partition you've gone and taken the wrong side and i said after all that we have suffered in partition who better than us can understand what it means to be targeted by hate in this way so i am with the people who are suffering that same hate today so i am on the right side you are on the wrong side don't you see so in the end is it my identity that is driving me uh, to fight discrimination or is it is it my belief that every human being uh, has a right to be herself uh, to follow her way of life her culture her religion and uh, and so on and if she is being targeted uh, i must stand with her so uh, so this is uh, you know this this is one more uh, worry that i have but the last and i I'll, i'll just talk about this is is my worry about you know these are the dangers why i feel that with all that the extraordinary things that the german people have done uh, to acknowledge that troubled violent history uh, why they still stand at the edge of that abyss so these were three reasons but the fourth is and i'd like you to just think about it a little is the problem with what constitutes being german who belongs I think if Germany is to be authentically democratic it must be willing bravely and generously to welcome people of diversity as equal citizens of this country. Germany was after the war still relatively homogeneous even uh, more so after most surviving Jews left its borders. Therefore to be honest Germans in fact found it difficult to welcome immigrants. The immigrants were called guest workers the underlying notion was we have invited you to work in our country but we expect you to go back to your land even your children and their children who were born in germany know no other country is germany cloaked its unwelcome in the garb of socialist solidarity it said it would welcome workers from socialist countries but we actually want you to go back and build socialism in your country yeah. you don't have to stay here has this changed when about a quarter of germans are estimated to be of immigrant background i fear not enough uh, the requirement for immigrants who seek a german passport to not just learn the german language but also the german way of life seems to me a fraught idea what is the german way of life is germany a multi religious country or a christian country is it multicultural or is there one dominant uh, culture to which all german citizens prospective uh, and and uh, indigenous must adhere is there and should there be a hierarchy of the right to belong what then is the place of people of color those not speaking german those who believe in islam in germany in which more than a, and more and more people are going to be of immigrant background germany had in fact a million people of african descent even uh, even uh, prior to the war were they germans were they full germans who belongs to this nation who does not belong and what are the conditionalities of belonging these are difficult questions that we must address uh, is the idea of germany still in practice that of a german speaking white christian heterosexual country Uh, do all those who do not conform to all of these and wish to belong they have to sort of try hard to be as much of at least to respect uh, these uh, given the nazi obsession with racial purity do not don't we see the pitfalls of this imagination of who belongs and who doesn't belong in fact i've spoken to many white non white german interlocutors uh, and they then tell me about how difficult it is for them to find acceptance uh, in this society um, in a sense uh, one of them said it is the immigrants 
coming into Germany who are reforming uh, German society. They're forcing, they're forcing the acceptance of diversity. Um, when I started my fellowship, I was searching for what the Indian people can learn from German, uh, Germany's journey of atonement. But as I went along, I increasingly felt that we have to learn from each other. And what I'm, you know, in my mind, increasingly there is an imagined dialogue between the German and the Indian people, learning from each other. What do I think that the German people can profit from learning, uh, profit from learning from India? I think both Indian and German people, and indeed all of humankind, can learn what is finest in India's civilizational practice as well. India has been brutal in its violent oppressions of caste and gender. However, at times, more than any other civilization, it has been most comfortable in embracing diversity. Christianity came to India a century, uh, many centuries before it came to Europe. Islam travelled to Indonesia not from Arabia but from India. Eight major religions of the world either originated or parked their caravans in India and then made this land their own. Each took from it but each gave to it as well. So let me sort of towards the end talk about what lessons I feel, you know, if what lessons the Indian people can learn from Germany I spoke about. What lessons do I believe that we also have to offer? Let me list. The first of them is the idea of equal belonging without conditionalities. You don't have to qualify to belong. You understand? You don't have to learn to be like us. You don't have to learn to speak my language, uh, to be eligible to belong. We need to accept, respect, learn, and in the end, celebrate each other, right? Um, and, 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 you know, very fine, uh, you know, I was having a discussion with this young woman, very fine person, but she said, you know, when the Syrian refugees came, I really had a problem because uh, when I would go swimming at the pool, uh, Syrian men would gather, young men, and watch me. And that's not acceptable to me. If they want to stay here, they must learn to respect women. I said, I understand that concern and appreciate it. But are white German men respectful to women consistently? Are there things that they don't do which is disrespectful to women? Of course they are. So I said, then couldn't you have said, we fought a hard in this country to find a place of equality and men of different communities in different ways are still disrespectful to us. That's a very different conversation from saying, you know, the white German men, of course, this is their country, who can, but you are coming from outside, you can't do ABC. So I, you know, it is this idea of conditionalities to belong, which I feel that at its best, the idea of India was you don't have to, you can speak your language. We have 22 national languages in India uh, and, and maybe thousands of, of actual languages. All of them are national languages. You know, uh, I, I, I work with homeless children and I love to talk to them saying, you know, we are such a beautiful country. We have so many festivals. We have Diwali, we have Holi, we have Eid, we have Christmas, we have, you know, these are all our festivals and the children understand that. We're such a lucky country, we celebrate in so many different ways. This idea of, of equal belonging it, uh, with, no, with no conditionality, I think, is, is one, except the conditionality of the acceptance of the values of the Constitution. The Constitution says gender equality is non negotiable. We must fight for it, but it's not a condition that only applies to the minority community. It also applies equally to the dominant majority community. Um, the second uh, idea that I thought is, is how we understand secularism at its best. Secularism in India was not conceptualized as the denial of religious faith, but instead equal respect for every faith, including the absence of faith. Uh, and this requires a lot of introspection. I think in some sense, the Abrahamic religions will have to reformulate 
See, if you believe that ours is the only path to heaven or to God, then how can you have equal respect for other paths? But we have to reformulate that for me, this is the best path. But there are other legitimate ways of, of reaching the same goal. So that idea of equal respect, I think, is, is including the absence of faith. It has to be equal respect, not just for faith, but the absence of faith itself. And the third is, is the recognition that hatred cannot be fought with hatred. This will only deepen hatred further. So when you're confronted with hate, how do you fight back? If you only mirror the same hate, like if it's dark in this room, and I say, I'm going to fight you by making every, all around, I'm also make it dark as revenge to you. It's only going to get darker. So, so this idea that I have to, you know, there may be a, a huge tempest uh, and there's darkness all around. I'll fight it by lighting even one lamp and somehow taking it through. So, uh, so this was this was the third lesson that I, I felt. We need a, an idiom of resistance to the politics of hate, to the social project of hate, which is not based on hate. And how does that, what will that look, look like? Try to build a social contract. We have to reimagine our world together. I mean, this time of civilizational crisis, what will a world look like where, we are where your neighbor is not, doesn't look like you, doesn't dress like you, doesn't worship like you, doesn't love like you, uh, doesn't eat like you, and you're comfortable with that person, you're welcoming to that person. What, what is this new social contract that I'm talking about? It has to be a, a social contract that also deals with inequality. Um, and I think at the core of it is that word that we've used so much uh, since the French Revolution, but I think understood it very little, practiced it even less. That word is fraternity. Uh, fraternity itself is a problematic word because it literally means brotherhood. And of course we're talking about a sisterhood as much as, as, as a brotherhood. But the, the Hindi uh, in the constitution in India, there's a Hindi word which I love a lot, which for, for fraternity, which is bandhuta. Bandhuta is derived from the Sanskrit, uh, which literally means that we are bound to and with each other. That with all the differences, we are bound to each other. So, if you have, you know, if you suffer pain, uh, tears well up in my eyes. If you, there are chains on your feet, I feel my freedom has been taken away. Um, Noam Chomsky spoke about the idea of social protection and he gave a very fine definition. He said, what is the idea of social protection? You know, that blonde man I'm reminded of who's carrying those two disabled people as a burden. What is the idea of social protection? The idea of social protection, he said, is ultimately the idea that we must take care of each other. We must take care of each other. It's not a burden. It's how a good society functions. So this imagination, and, and I think we have to begin a whole process of reimagining a social contract that is founded on the idea of, and the many fraternity ideas to Bandhuta, of, uh, many sibling ideas that I can speak of. There's empathy, there's uh, compassion, but even compassion, it's not a compassion that you are here and I'm here and I'm giving you compassion. It's an egalitarian compassion. It's a compassion between equals. That we're two human beings of equal worth and dignity. You've suffered a lot and I'm here and I care and I'm reaching out to you. But actually a day can come when I'll be suffering a lot and you equally uh, will be able to reach out to me. It's, 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 a different, uh, it's a different idea and ultimately I spoke about radical love and, and what is radical love? A, 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 a social way of living our lives together with radical love. love it, it's love based on its enormous courage. It is the love that, uh, that for instance when I told you the story of Mahatma Gandhi, 
when a million people had killed each other, Pakistan had been constituted on the basis of religion, 15 million people had been displaced, there was anger, there was hate. He knew that this was going to take his life. And yet he said, no, we will be a country of kindness and inclusion for all people. Uh, that's radical love for me. Uh, and, and we need to find our capacities uh, for radical love. Um, and I'll just finish here with two examples, because just to underline that these are not far out ideas that are impossible, because that might be, I'm not talking about uh, impossible ideas. Uh, this, the, the battery is gone again. Uh, I'm really talking about, uh, and I, I, I'd like to give you an example actually from New Zealand. Uh, Jacinda Ardern, the, the Prime Minister there, she's probably the global leader I admire the most uh, at this moment. So at Christchurch, uh, you might recall a few years ago, uh, a, a, a young man uh, live streamed while he went to two mosques and uh, shot 50 shot, people shot. down. So he shot, shot. He, he shot 50 people down. Uh, and uh, 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 how did she respond? She actually did the first thing she did was almost exactly what we do in the Karwani Mahabharat, which was our resolve that we will go to every home where people have suffered from hate and tell them that, that they're people who care and sit with them, embrace them. And that's precisely what she did. Instinctively, that was her first response. And you could see the pain in her own face as she went. She refused to name, we still don't know the name of that young man who did the killing. She said, I don't want his name ever to go into history. He is not us, though he was a white indigenous New Zealander. He said, he is not us, the people he killed are us. And uh, Muslims constitute less than 1%, they're recent immigrants. He said, they are us, he was not us. Uh, she covered her head out of cultural respect when she went and met them. A week later, in the next Friday prayers, uh, the sound of the Azan was played across New Zealand from all uh, radios and uh, TV stations. Women across New Zealand covered their heads, police women, news readers, out of a, an expression of reaching out uh, to people who had suffered. People gathered outside mosques and joined hands like this and locked hands together and said, you pray, we will stand in guard. The Imam at the end of this said, uh, you know, he said that uh, New Zealand has taught the world what it means to love. And uh, we are broken, but we are not broken hearted because of this love. I think the problem with us in much of the world, including my own, is that we are not broken hearted when so much cruelty is done around us, which shows how broken we've become. Right? And lastly, an individual story, and then I'll hand over to my friend here yeah. um, for some question and answers. This is a, a story, again, close to my heart, uh, again of an imam. Um, so I was describing how these riots are manufactured uh, on festivals in recent years where you gather outside mosques and you, uh, and you create. But anyway, a skirmish broke out in a Bengali town called Asansol. And once the riots happened, then a typical situation is created where uh, two Hindu boys were caught up in, in the Muslim area and one Muslim boy was caught up in the Hindu area. And it was a hostage situation. You return our boys and then we return our, your, your boys. The Imam said, this is completely wrong. Think of the pain that the children of these two Hindu boys will be facing, the parents. So we will return them unconditionally and we will hope that they return our child. They did that. The child who was not returned till then was the Imam's own son. He waited and waited till midnight. Uh, he got a phone call in the end saying, we sorry we found your child but he has been killed. His eyes gouged out, uh, his body sort of half burnt. 
his first reaction to the officer was said don't tell anybody i will break the news otherwise this country the city will burn so the next morning when namaz was held after the namaz he, he tells them you'll notice that my son is not with me the reason is that this is what has happened to my son but but uh, my son's death is a huge tragedy to me but a much greater tragedy to me would be if you harm a single hindu even by your tongue by your thoughts let alone by your hands in your own uh, when we went there in the kala uh, many young men were there and they were weeping as they spoke to me because they said we we grown up as children in front once we we would have gone and killed people in the den instead what we did was we formed squads outside the hindu settlements in our area we protected every hindu life as our tribute to uh, to the imam and it is it is this this quality of radical love that we all have the capacity for which we have to find in the way we relate to each other otherwise you know in this moment of civilization crisis we all stand on that abyss at the edge of that abyss and we can all fall and we can all begin to close our shut down our conscience and follow the strong man is that where we want to be thank you